We call it Father's Day. But you know, when you say something like that, it's really just the name. It's the name that we call it. But you know, fathers, the name is bigger than those who have contributed in birthing a child. Y'all understand that, right? It also talks about father figures. Talks about stepfathers. You know, when you talk about stepfathers, I could, t I could tell you a number of people who have stepped up to raise children that are not even their own. For somebody that's done something like that, we are honoring y'all today, brothers. Because you didn't have to do that. Today is your day. Mentors. You may not necessarily have any children on your own, but you have mentored a lot of people. You have become a father figure to a lot of people. We are honoring you today. Some people may not like that, but if you are having an impact on somebody else, you deserve to be honored today. If you are making some or helping to make somebody's life better than what it was, you deserve to be honored today. Our mentors, our coaches, very, very good friends. Anyone who has had a positive impact on the life of somebody else. And why do I open it up like that? Because see, what I've seen is, is that there are men, there are women, there are families who can't have children on their own. And just because you can't have a child on your own doesn't mean you can't be a father. The fact you can't have children on your own doesn't automatically exclude you from being able to be a father. So we are honoring all of you today, and we don't thank you as much as we should for all you do. It's not easy. But many of you are doing an amazing job. And today, we as a group, to you all, say thank you. Now say it with me, say thank you. Y'all thank a father today. I know it sounds weird, but you know what? The jobs that we do, it's not to compare it to Mother's Day. It's not compared to mothers. I'm not saying one is better than the other. But it's also not easy being a father as well. Think about the people who have had an impact on your life. If you could go back and say thank you to them, would you do it? Absolutely. So for those who are having an impact on others, today we say thank you. Your impact goes beyond what you know. And when we get an opportunity, if you could share this message later with our men, with our brothers, with, with our guys, our fellas, share it to encourage them, to thank them, because all of you are special. And it's not just because you're a dad, you're a mentor, you're a coach. It's not just because of that. But it's also because you are a believer who does what you do. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 26 says, He who fears the Lord has a secure fortress, and for his children it will be a refuge. He who fears the Lord will, has a secure fortress. That's in God, as you know. But for his children it will be a refuge. So not only do you have a, fort, a, a secure fortress because of what you believe, because of you, your children have a safe place also. What you do benefits others. Children, they are blessed because of their fathers. God honors families because of you. You are supposed to be the lead. You are the ones that lead the house in the way that it's supposed to go, which means you can lead it closer to God or you can lead it further away from God. But when you lead it closer to God, God honors your family because of you. God honors families because of you. He honors generations because of you. And what that means is, is that many, 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 many years from now, when we are all gone to be with the Lord, if he hadn't come back yet, your great, 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 great grandchildren can be blessed because of you. Your great, great, great grandchildren can be blessed because of you. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 7 says this, the righteous man leads a blameless life. And then the second part says, blessed are his children. But it doesn't stop there. 
It says, blessed are his children after him. Which means that you will have an impact on the future that you'll never be able to see yourself. Because of what it is that you were doing, you're not only impacting the kids that you have now or those you have an influence over right now, but you are influencing generations to come. God is blessing them because of the work that you do today. And today we say thank you for doing that. So, fathers, your children are blessed because of your faithfulness to God. Children are blessed because of your faithfulness to God. Y'all do realize that not every, not every child has a, what's the way to say it? Sometimes you can get in trouble. Some of the kids may not be acting right. But you do know that even though when they're not acting right, they're still blessed because of you. Which means that even though they may have turned away from the church, because you are still here, God still has his hand on them because of you. Your children are blessed because of you. Your children are blessed because of your relationship with him. And this is something that we can look at with gratefulness. Because what we have, what we've been given, this is not random. All our fathers in here, all of those who are making an impact in somebody else's life, let me tell you something. You have been chosen. You have been chosen. You didn't plan it. It's not something that you could have said, this is what I want to do. This is not just a happy accident. You were chosen for this moment. You're not here just to be here. Part of your purpose in being here is to have an impact on somebody else. God chose you to have an impact on someone. And because you were chosen for it, it's not just random. The people who come into your life that you do have an impact on, God put them there for a reason. He put them there in front of you for a reason. He led them to you for a reason, or he gave them to you for a reason. And if God did all of that, if God chose you for this, and he supplied people for you, what did he do? He made sure that you were, could handle this. You were called and built to walk in this. You say, well, being a father, some of you may have mixed feelings about it. But you know what? God still chose you. God still called you, and he still equipped you for doing the work that you're doing. And so for everybody that you are having an impact on, they are blessed because of you. And again, we want to say thank you for that. The Bible tells us specifically in Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6, it says, train a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not turn from it. Somebody say train. It says train a child in the way that he should go. And there's something specific about this. When you read this, it says train what type of child? A child. A child. Now, that stuck out to me, and I said, okay, look, let me go and look this up in a couple of different places to see if it says that exact same thing. So I, I looked up the King James, the New King James, the English Standard. Those three are word for word, right? Then we are already looking at the NIV that was up there. I checked the Amplified and the New Century. All of them say train up a child in the way that he should go. What it did not say was only train up your children. Train up a child, not just your children. Fathers, if I see anything, this is telling us that we should be having an impact on somebody else other than what's in our four walls. Because the Bible says that when these children get old, they won't turn away from the training that they've had. Y'all, I can tell y'all that the world is full of many older men and women who don't know where they came from. They don't know who they belong to because they weren't properly trained as a child. 
Because if the scripture says when they get older, they won't depart from it. If they have departed from it, then it wasn't given to them in the first place. And the many times that we have looked around the households that we have had, I'm going to make sure this is the best household that, that I can make it. But we allow everybody else's household to fall down. If God put us there, we are to have an impact on as many as we can. It's more than just a child. Well, more than that, just our child, I should say. Maybe the world would have been different if more of us were trained a child instead of our child. This is a major calling, though. And it's not easy, and it's, it's hard work, but it will pay off. Because the Lord is not asking you to do something that he won't bless you for doing. That he won't equip you from do, for doing. In Psalm 127, verses 3 through 5, it says this. Sons are a heritage from the Lord. Children a reward from him. Verse 4 says, like arrows in the hands of a warrior are sons born in one's youth. And it says in verse 5, blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be put to shame when they're con when they contend with their enemies at the gates. Now this is saying that your children are a heritage. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. Now as you're reading this, let's put this in context. This is not telling you to go crazy out here. That's not what this is saying. Doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be a part of the creation of these children. And what do I mean by that? There may be some others in your life who you actually call son that are not yours. There may be some that you call daughter who are not yours. But it's the impact that you have. They may not be your actual children, but the impact that you have is something that makes you, as well as them, blessed. Blessed is the person who has many. Many children, many sons and daughters, much influence and much impact. All right, all right. The more and more people who you can help to become closer to know the Lord, the bigger the impact. And their line is blessed because of what you do. So it means to be grateful for that. That's the kind of impact that you have. Psalm 78 verse 5 says this, he decreed statutes, statutes for Jacob and established the law in Israel, which he commanded, y'all watch this, which he commanded our forefathers to teach their children. They were commanded to teach these things to their children. Why? Verse 6 tells you why. Verse 6 says, so the next generation would know them, even the children yet to be born, and they in turn would tell their children. And what happens when all of this happens? Verse 7. Then they would put their trust in God and would not forget his deeds, but would keep his commands. Somebody's got to train our children. I said again, somebody has got to do it. If we don't do it, somebody else will. And a lot of times somebody else doing it is how our kids get into stuff. When you allow somebody else to do it, you don't know what they're learning. They might be telling them about God or they might be telling them about something else. That's why we have to have the impact. You all are in here, y'all are believers of the Lord. You got to make sure that these children know the same thing. To so let them know the God that you know. This is what the impact is. Good fathers, they help their children know the Lord. Good fathers help their children know the Lord to help them know who God is. In Joshua 24, verse 14, it says, Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. We should say it, we could end it just like that. But it also says, Throw away the gods that your forefathers worshiped beyond the river in Egypt. 
and serve the Lord. In verse 15, let's keep going. It says, but if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, if you don't want to do it, then choose for yourself this day who you're going to serve. Make the decision today whether it be the gods your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me, in my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Now, there are a couple of things in this, right? So if we go back to verse 15, verse 15 says, but if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Choose who you're going to serve. All right, now the next part of that says this. Whether the gods your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. Y'all see the two choices there. You are going to be, if you don't serve the Lord, you're serving somebody. And it's going to be the God of either those fathers, somebody else, or a God of something else. But there is an opportunity to make sure that they know which one that is going to be. And that is what you do. Because you say you can serve whoever you want to. But as for me, the impact I'm going to make, me and my household, we're going to serve the Lord. This is the trait of a good father. There are many good fathers here. But we also know, in terms of being a good father, it's not just about teaching them manners. It's not just about teaching them to be polite. It's not about just always explaining how to handle that bully at school and not just about attending their sports games or, or even watching sports with them on the weekends. It's not just about teaching hard work and discipline. It's not just teaching them about the opposite sex and how to deal with it. But it's about teaching them where their help comes from. It's about teaching them to know who to go to when they can't come to you with certain things. It's about teaching them to know that there's a God that loves them more than they would ever know. Now, all of these things go together, but don't overlook the main one while we're doing the others. This is the impact of a good father, to make sure that your children know who our God is. Because when they come to know who our God is, they're going to tell somebody too. They're going to tell their children. And when their children come to know the Lord, they're going to tell their children. And when their children come to know the Lord, we probably be gone by now, but they're going to tell their children. And they're going to tell their children. And the work that you did at this moment today over the last 20 years, over the last 50 years, will be a blessing to you and the rest of all of these people that you had an impact on. What you're doing right now isn't just affecting them at this moment, but this is going to shape their future as well as so many others. And that is the impact of a good father. You're not just worried about what you can see, but you're worried about what you can't see as well too. And you are making sure that the line that you start continues from here on out. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 6, uh, verse six Deuteronomy 6 and 6, it says, These commandments I give to you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your, on your children. Do y'all see it? First line, impress them on your children. These commandments I give you today, the things that I'm telling you to do right now, don't you just hear, but you tell your children about it as well too. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up, who are you talking to? You're talking to your house, your children, the people you have an impact on. Talk about God. Verse 8 says, tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads and write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Make sure that the word is so present around the house that people can't come in and not see that this is a godly household. That these kids can't grow up in this and not see that this is a house where the Lord lives at. Don't just have your Bible set up on a coffee table where other people come in and see it closed and think, oh, this is a godly house, but the Bible got dirt on it. No, open it up. Go before the Lord with your children. How do we do that? I got four ways. Many of us are probably doing, if not all of these, some of these, but if you are doing all four, let's do them. 
Four ways that we can help our children know the Lord. First, talk to our children about the Lord. You know, when you start talking to your children about the Lord, you start getting questions about the Lord. I got a five-year-old, and when I tell y'all the questions that he asked me, but it comes from a desire to actually know. And I'm not going to get in the way of that. Talk to your children about the Lord. Number two, pray with your children each night. And if you can't be there with them each night as best as you can, pray with them as often as you can. Number three, letting our children see us pray for them when they need it. When your children are sick, don't just pray for them before you go to bed. No, go pray for them and let them see you do it. We had an oil anointing service here a few months ago. Get that oil out. Let them hear you go before God on their behalf. They don't have to just say, well, yeah, I know, I know they pray. No, they've seen you do it. Because they can learn how to go before the Lord based off of your relationship with him. And then number four, you give your children an opportunity to pray for you. This is one that we may not think about. Ask your children, do they want to pray? They can pray before you eat. They can say the prayers in the evening time. You can ask them if you're not feeling well, ask them to pray for you. Give them an opportunity to be able to go before the Lord on your behalf. They may not fully know what they're doing, but you know, the more and more they do it, they're going to begin to start hearing some answers or seeing some answers to some of the things that they prayed for. And learning to see God, to hear his voice, that is the way you start. This is why the Bible tells us to train them. This is how they know, this is how they know God. And there's examples of the Bible of that type of training that takes place. In 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 1. 1 Samuel talks about this young boy named Samuel. The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. Somebody say Eli. Eli. Now, we don't talk much about Eli, but we're going to talk about him today. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. One night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, he was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. Verse 4 says, then the Lord called Samuel, and Samuel answered, here I am. Verse 5 says, and he ran to Eli and said, here I am, you called me. What we're reading is Samuel was ministering. He was in the temple, he was in the church, whatever you want to call the word. He was in the presence of the Lord. But it was also at a time when the word of the Lord was rare. He wasn't saying much. So Samuel was just there. He might have been doing something because he was, you know, this is where you should be. I love God. I hadn't heard from him. I don't know any of this other kind of stuff, but this is where I'm going to be. And he's lying down in the temple when all of a sudden he hears somebody call him. Samuel. He says, oh, here I am. He gets up and he runs to Eli, who was lying down in his usual place. It was late. Eli was probably trying to sleep. You called me. And so what happens? Continuing that verse, the second half of verse five. Eli said, I didn't call you. Go back and lie down. So he went and he lay down. Verse six says, again, the Lord called. Who's calling? Not Eli, right? The Lord calls in verse 6, he says, Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, here I am. You called me. My son, Eli said, I'm trying to go to sleep. You keep waking me up. I did not call you. Go back and lie down. And verse 7 says something really important here. Verse 7 says, now Samuel didn't yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. So if he didn't know the Lord, he definitely doesn't know his voice. And he's in the right place, but he doesn't know the voice that's talking to him. Y'all hear me? The Lord is calling, although he don't recognize it. 
Verse 8. The Lord called Samuel a third time. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, here I am. You call me. Then Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. A second and a third time this happened. Samuel heard the voice of the Lord, but thought it was Eli. Again, what we said in verse 7, he did not yet know the Lord. So he's only doing what he would naturally do. If you all are in, in one room at a house and you hear somebody call your name, you're going to think about it as the person who's on the other end of the house. You may not necessarily be expecting a random voice, especially if you don't know the voice of the Lord. But this is showing that the Lord is calling people who may not yet know him. And what it requires is somebody who can see it to have an impact on that individual person to let them know who the Lord is and who is calling them. So let's go to verse 9. Eli told Samuel, once he realized that it was the Lord calling him, he told Samuel, go and lie down, and if he calls you, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And so Samuel went and lay down in his place. The Lord came and stood there. The Lord came and stood there. Calling as at the other times. See, he didn't say he came and stood there before. He could have been calling from wherever he was. But see, now that Samuel knows who the Lord is based on, the, on somebody else, the Lord said, I can get close to you now. Calling him just like before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel says, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And guess what the Lord did? He spoke. He told him in verse 11, he said, and the Lord said to Samuel, see, I'm about to do something in Israel that will make the ears of everyone who hears it tingle. And I'm telling one person about it right now, and it's you. So let me ask you a question. What if Eli didn't tell him that it was the Lord calling? Do you realize the impact? This was not Eli's actual son. But he had an impact. This man may or may not have been a father, but he was walking in that car that night. What do we know about Samuel? This man would grow up and be a great prophet. Yes, sir. Great. But not only would he be a great prophet, he would be told to go and find another young boy. Yeah. Come on. And that young boy, out of all the people who were in the house with that young boy, yeah. well, actually, he wasn't even in the house. He was out somewhere else. The Lord said, I need you to go and anoint the next king of Israel. Right. See, Samuel learned to speak so well with the Lord that the Lord started doing stuff through him. And he got to a point where he was going to, he went to Jesse, got all of his sons. No, there's got to be another one because the Lord has not released me. Do you know how good of a relationship you got to have with God to be able to say that? He says, oh, I got my youngest out there in the field. Go get him. They bring another young boy in here. And guess what Samuel does? He anoints this young boy as the next king of Israel. Sets this man up to know the favor of the Lord. And it makes David crazy. Because David, years later, when a giant shows up, because of the Lord that he was taught from Samuel, who was taught from Eli, he can go and chase this giant down and say, you're not going to kill me because my God said I'm going to be king. But what if Samuel didn't do it? And what if Eli didn't do it? This is how your impact goes beyond whatever you could ever imagine. David was known as one of the greatest people in the Bible, and it all came because some people listening to the Lord above him. You don't know the impact that you can have on somebody else. Brothers, the influence that you have with others cannot be measured. And also, should we keep going from David? Because David had more people in his line as well, too. Of people who knew and feared the Lord. 
to a point to where the Lord says, I'm going to come down and save all of humanity from their sin. And I'm going to choose a line to do it. I'm going to choose a line that knows me. I'm going to choose a line that is faithful to me. For those of y'all who don't know, Christ himself was a descendant of David. But again, what if Samuel didn't anoint David? And what if Eli didn't tell Samuel who the Lord was in the first place? And whoever put Eli in the place to be where he was, what if that person didn't tell him? This is why the influence you have can't be measured. There's another man in the Bible named Timothy. He had a mentor. The man's name was Paul. The honor that Paul called him on a couple of occasions a son. This was not Paul's actual son. But it was somebody he was having an impact on. Timothy had a church. Timothy had a place. And Paul said, look, I am going to help you to be able to get that house in order. What if Paul didn't do that? And not only was Paul's letters given to Timothy, thousands of years later, do we not still read those same letters? The impact of what was done once before to one individual person did not stop with them. But even to this day, we are blessed because of things that was written to another person in terms of how to get to know the Lord. The impact that you have, fathers, cannot be measured. That's why we say thank you. Because again, your impact cannot be calculated. Today we honor our fathers. We honor those who have helped lead us those who have served as a positive influence in our lives. Because you love the Lord. Because you hear the Lord when he speaks. Because you make an influence on those who are brought into your circle. Yes. 